Okay, so uh, welcome everyone to the Kadanoff seminar. Today we're very happy to have Sahan Saif Nashri from Stony Brook, who's going to be telling us about no invertible symmetries in QFTs in one plus one dimensions. Please. Okay. Yeah. So, hello everyone. Thank you very much for inviting me uh, to, to give this seminar. It's already an honor, and it's really great to be here um, in here in Chicago. So, so today I'm going to talk about two DT QFTs with non invertible symmetries. So this uh, this talk will be basically um, um, yeah uh, mostly based on these two papers. One paper that I we did before with Zoran Kamagaski, Kantaro, uh, Konstantinos is at UCLA, and the, the more recent work that we did with Jimmy Huang and Ying Wen uh, a couple of months ago. So uh, so before starting, uh, let me just start with a very very broad motivation. So I, I want to uh, motivate, so basically the type of questions that uh, we want to understand. The general goal is to understanding the, the IR or the, the dynamics or IR phases of uh, strongly coupled quantum field theory. Let's say you have a QFT in the UV and you want to do the RG flow and understand what's the theory in the IR. So that's the general goal that you want to understand. And one example, for example, is understanding the phases of gauge theory, whether they are confining or deconfining. And this is usually a, a very hard problem. So you want to understand some, find some non perturbative tools. That is true beyond the regime of perturbation theory, and usually the global symmetry uh, is, is such a tool. So one tool is a uh, global symmetry. Uh, and it's two phenomena. That's a famous example, and that's because a symmetry and its two phenomena is invariant under the RG flow. It cannot change under continuous deformation. So if you compute uh, the anomaly in the UV, it should match with the IR, and it's already constrained the dynamics. It's a tooth anomaly matching. But so in this talk, we are interested in generalized global symmetries. We want to generate global symmetry and derive some new consequences. So in the first part, I, I, I given a pedagogical introduction to non invertible symmetries, and in the second part, I try to uh, find some dynamical application of it. Okay, so let me begin with the introduction. Introduction to non invertible symmetries. So to begin, I, I want to start with this modern point of view of symmetry, which it should be familiar, most of you, which is a, a symmetry By the way, if you think something else clear, please ask, and if, if I'm writing something small, remind me. So the modern view of symmetry is that symmetry is the same as having a topological operator. So basically, this is because we know if you have a continuous symmetry, we have the notary current, and we can integrate the current, the conserved current, on any manifold. For example, we could, uh, so usually you could say that you have a, a d minus one form, which is closed, and you could integrate, this is the notary current, you could integrate it over any d minus one dimensional manifold and you get a charge. But this charge is conserved through time. So usually we take sigma to be a, 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 a time, constant time slice to be a space, and uh, because dj is closed, this is conserved on time. But you could integrate it over any closed d minus one dimensional manifold, and the fact that dj is closed, it means that this is invariant under small deformations of sigma. Or put it in another way, Q is a topological operator. Or you could more generally define a charged operator. A charged operator. You could take the exponential. So this is the, usually the unitary operator that implements the symmetry, the sigma. So that's why this definition is coming from. So now, 
in the following five minutes, I'm trying to convince you that why this definition works. I'm, I'm trying to convince you that all the notions that you know about ordinary symmetry can be translated into the language of topological defects. So to be concrete, I'm going to focus on symmetries in two dimensions. So symmetries in 2D, and this should be the same as topological line defects or operators. And I'll also use the word defects and operators interchangeably. So if you are in 2D, a co-dimension one surface is a line, so symmetries are the same as lines. I'm going to just give you a dictionary between all the notions that we have about the symmetries. And to be concrete, I'm going to mostly uh, focus on discrete symmetries or like finite symmetries. Okay? Just to be clear, you mean two space time dimensions, right? One plus one? One plus one, exactly. Yeah. Are you assuming compact Euclidean space time? Are you, Say that again, sir? Are you assuming compact Euclidean space time, or you, you don't care? Uh, doesn't matter, but you can maybe do compact space, maybe compact space time. I don't care what, what happens at infinity, so. And the symmetries can be defined on local by, so it's something that you could do, operation that you could do local. Okay, so, so we have the unitary symmetry operator. So if you, if you insert, so if you have your topological line, if you insert, so I, I have a one space and one time, so if I wrap my topological line on the space, I get a unitary, the, the unitary symmetry operator that implements the symmetry. It gives me a map from the Hilbert space on the circle to Hilbert space on the circle, right? But uh, I could also insert the topological, so here is, this is space. And this is time. But I could also insert my topological line, which is going along the time, and this for me defined a G twisted boundary condition. Then I have these lines. And then I could act on local operators. So action on local operators, and this is the same as this picture. So I have a local operator, I have a topological line, shrink it, and I get a new local operator. And this is the same as action of uh, topological lines on operators. And then I have the this group law. So I know that if I have, so my symmetry operators are elements by something in the subgroup. So if I have UG1, UG2, when I take the, when I compose this two operation, I get a new operator which is labeled by G1, G2, and I also have the inverse. That if I have the, 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 the complex conjugate, I get the one given by the inverse group element, G inverse. And this, this fusion, this, this multiplication is just given by the fusion of line. So I could have G1, G2, make them close to each other, but because they are topological lines from the line distances, they just look like a single line, and this single line is labeled by G1, G2. So this translates to the fusion of the lines, and then I could also extend this. So I could also add... Sorry, can I ask you a question? Yes. So, so the statement on the left seems just totally exact. This thing you just said on the right seems like there's some IR limit you're taking. No, because the lines are topological, so uh, the distance doesn't matter. Right? So when you shrink it, you get that. Right? So couple lines So we know that if you have a symmetry, it's very useful to couple it to a background gauge field. And coupling to a background gauge field is correspond to inserting these defects into your, into your space time. So it's just inserting defects. Inserting a network of defects. And any network of defects correspond to a gauge field. But here I'm talking about uh, just a discrete symmetries, so I could only couple it with a flat background gauge field. Okay. Then you could gauge the symmetry, meaning summing over all different possible uh, insertions. And we know that this 
procedure might not be uh, always well defined, and because we could have a tooth anomaly. And tooth anomaly corresponds to this picture. So when you have a four uh, main junction of lines, you could make it ambiguous. It's usually ambiguous because you could disambiguate into two two-way, three-way junctions. And if these two configurations are not identical, you have a tooth anomaly. It means that there is no consistent way to gauge it or inserting this network of defects. So it's G1, G2, lines come, fuse to G1, G2, because of this group law, and this is the tooth anomaly. Yes? You know, this is supposed to just be a sketch, but in the definition of line operators, if you give a more precise definition of them, is there a arbitrary phase in their definition or how they act on the Hilbert space or something? Because the group yeah. line you've given on the left clearly is not correct in general. There can be projective representations. So UG1, UG2 could be E to the I5, G1, G2 times U, G1, G2. And I'm wondering where that phase that possibility of projective representation comes into the definition of how you compose line operators. So in, in this definition, there is no phase ambiguity because the, the topological line you cannot multiply by phase. It's just well, in the group law that you wrote down, that is not the most general law if you have a unitary representation of a group acting on a complex Hilbert space. There could be a phase. The, the multiplication law in the group G does not have to be the same as the multiplication law of the unitary operators that represent the group if there's a projective representation. Right, that corresponds to the anomaly when you have a projective representation, but... Uh, but shouldn't that same ambiguity be, exist in the definition of composition of lines? You mean here, right? No, I mean on the right hand. On the left hand side, there's clearly a well-known ambiguity in the composition law of two unitary operators. It depends on a phase, which yeah, you yeah. may or may not be able to remove, depending on whether, yeah. basically yeah. depending okay. on the group call. I, I guess. So shouldn't there also be a corresponding phase ambiguity in the definition of the okay. composition right. of line okay. operators? So, okay. I maybe I know how to answer this. Because, so you could have uh, many lines, but there could be two lines which are actually isomorphic to each other. And two lines are isomorphic if they are related by junction. And this junction basically could absorb this phase. So no. when I write this, this is just a, this means that these two lines are isomorphic. I, I, I pick an isomorphism class, and there could be a phase here, but this is just at the level of isomorphism. Sorry, but I think what you're saying is, is like the freedom to absorb a phase in UG1, which you have. And you can absorb a phase in UG2, and you can form a phase in UG1, G2, but you can't always totally remove the phase that's in right, composition that's right. law. Yes, yes. Because it's, it's cohomological. That's right. That's, yeah, so yeah. shouldn't that same ambiguity exist in the composition of lines? If I'm, to, if I'm saying something crazy, then somebody else should correct me and tell me I should. But isn't, shouldn't there be such an ambiguity? Since you mean, I, I mean, instead of phase here, that's what you're asking? I want to, yeah, a phase in the composition law, analogous to the phase that you can have when you have U sub G1, G2. So the, on the left-hand side, you could write U G1, G2 times E to the I phi of G1 comma G2. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that phase is not <coughs> always removable. I just don't, uh, okay, I just. Maybe, maybe, maybe what, what do you mean by U sub G1, G2? Is this some straight homomorphism that you've, you've mapped between the group? In the space of unitary operators. I mean, what Jeff is saying is completely true in quantum mechanics. Right? We, we, we know this is the case. Well, this is quantum mechanics, isn't it? I mean, you've got yeah, a complex yeah, Hilbert space, and you've got yeah. a unitary operator acting on a complex Hilbert space. So, have you left that ambiguity in, you, in what you're calling U sub G1 G2? Okay, the, the fact is that it, it, it's not meaningful that, say, I have some line G, I have some any line, and I multiply it by phase, and I get a new line. So, this, this object is not a well defined. Uh, line defects because it is not going to define a well defined G twisted boundary condition for me. So I cannot just put a line, put a face here, but 
What I can say, I can say that, okay, I have a group G corresponding to every group, group element, I have a, a line. So I have a basis. But when I fuse these two, I get a new, I get a new line defect, which, which is isomorphic to the line labeled by this. But this isomorphism, I have to keep track of it. It's like a junction between these two lines. So basically this picture, I, I draw something later, but is, is, this picture is something like that. That G1 come in, G2 come in, and I have a new line, which is like G1, G2. Okay. So because I think it's, Jeff's asking about the fusion rule. I mean, your, your lift of the group G to the action on the Hilbert space has an ambiguity in general. So pick a projective representation. Yeah. And, and where, where is that ambiguity on the right-hand side? Yeah. So in what you're calling G1, G2? I mean, there is, the, the fusion rule is just yeah. unique. There's no ambiguity in the fusion rule. There's an ambiguity in that point. There's it's an an junction. Yeah, there's an ambiguity in the junction, right? You can address yes. the junction by H2 of, yeah, exactly. uh, of the group G. So you have the that, That's where the... Yeah. You have so the line should be this into it's this. this. So, this yeah, yeah. So, so when you say that when, when you have a Y junction, there's a distinguished point. Yeah. And you can say, can I decorate this point by a phase? And, um, and, that's the, that's the, and the, the label for that phase is, is H2 of G. It's exactly the projector. Well, so, and it's so not canonical. Well, it sounds like that lower picture is not really defining the fusion correctly, that you've got to define it through the three point function. Yeah, yeah. this is yeah. the correct picture, is this. If okay. I want to be very okay. okay. because I have the line G1, G2, and I have this is actually the fusion. But this phase that you could put here, there is no canonical choice here. Well, it's a one dimensional vector space. Depend, it depends on the cohomology of the group G that the little G's are elements of. But when you want to gauge it, then there is a choice that you have to make here. But there's no canonical choice that you could make. Okay. Thanks for this. Okay, so then the two phenomena is here, and actually this is labeled by, so this, these are in general deferred by phase, which is something in the uh, G1, G2, and G3, and G4 is fixed, is something in H3. And so these have to satisfy some, uh, this, this is the F function, have to satisfy some pentagon identity, which corresponds to the cross cycle condition. I'll explain this more in the non case. Okay. But, okay, so is there any other question? So this is just a dictionary between the notion about symmetries in terms of defects. So I want to now go into the non-invertible defects, non-invertible symmetries. Okay. So for non-invertible so non symmetries, when we have defects, it's not guaranteed that every line has an inverse, right? So you could just relax this condition of the invertibility of line under fusion, and you get a, so your group law, becomes a fusion rule. So I could fuse two lines, and on the right-hand side, I don't get a unique line, but I, could, I get a line which is not simple. I get a linear, a direct sum of different lines. And this fusion coefficient, what it actually means, to be very precise, is this picture. That I have the line Li, I have a line Lj, and I have a line Lk, but then there is a choice of topological junction that I can choose, mu, and this mu, it belongs to this junction vector space, and the dimension of this is, is the fusion coefficient. So this, 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 these are non-negative integers. And the meaning of this is the dimension of this, this vector space that exists here. So for invertible one, it's just a one-dimensional vector space, which is only exists for that respects the fusion rule. That's the meaning of this thing. So that's one thing that changes from going from invertible to non-invertible. The other thing is this anomaly. So, so very roughly, the truth anomaly becomes like an F matrix or F move. This is the F matrix of Seiberg and Moore. So this is just the generalization of that. So if I have a line like A, R, J, K, L, X, Thank you. 
So these are also called six J symbols. These two pictures now are deferred by a matrix, which actually acts on these two vector spaces. So this label by six, uh, uh, six labels, and it's actually a, a, ma a, ma a matrix from these vector spaces to these vector spaces. And these have to satisfy some pentagon identity. So at the end of the day, this is just the two data of my uh, of, of non-invertible symmetries. It's a fusion rule, and it's these F matrices. This is um, the absence of a tooth anomaly maps to this, or? Okay, so here it is more tricky to quantify the tooth anomaly. This F always exists, and these are also not, uh, they are gauge, they are not gauge invariant, because you could do a, uh, do a change of basis. This is written in some basis, you, you pick a basis for these vector spaces, and you write these 6J symbols. There's a gauge uh, ambiguity to write it, but there is no way of quantifying it, like a core cycle. For core cycle, we could define a multiplication law, and there is a meaning of zero. There is a canonical choice of zero, but here there is no canonical choice of zero. But there are some cases that you could turn F to be just the identity. And that's for the group case, when it's invertible. When it's non-invertible, there is no zero function of trivial. Okay. So this fusion coefficient n plus f, it gave form as some mathematical some mathematical framework I call a fusion category. And the classification of fusion category is very rich, is like a generalization of classification of finite groups. That there are some rigidity theorem that says that if you fix the fusion rule, there are only finite number of solutions for these f moves. And the classification is very rich. If you fix the rank of the fusion category, there's only finitely many fusion categories. And it has, as a subsector, the classification of finite groups. It's a, a subset of this classification. Of the yes? Why should I still think of this as a symmetry if I can invert it? OK, it's, it's, it's a symmetry in the sense that all the things that, that you know and useful for symmetries works here. For example, if you have a symmetry, you know it's, it's uh, preserved along the RG flow. So you could consider the QFT in the UV. You could add a deformation, which is preserved under the symmetry. Here, preserved means it, it comes with the topological lines. If you have such a deformation, then you could uh, prove that the symmetry is these topological lines remain topological during the RG flow. And it has to match from the UV to IR. Then you have a selection route for amplitudes. If you, if you com compute the three-point function, you could insert a topological lines, do some modification, and you see some selection rules on amplitude. You could gauge them also, I would discuss, perhaps not in detail, and there's obstruction to gauging. So all the thing, all the power of symmetry is also true here. But yeah, they differ from this number too. Is there any question? What's the relationship between a fusion category and a modular tensor category? Okay, great. So here, uh, the data is just fusion and um, the F matrices, and this lives in 2D, T, 2D QFTs. But in 3D T QFTs, we know that the topological lines form a modular tensor category because they also have a braiding in three dimension. So if you if you have fusion uh, F matrices and also R, R matrices such that they are non-degenerate, they form a unitary modular tensor category. But if you forget about the braiding, they just become fusion category. So basically, given any UMTC, you could forget about the braiding or the R matrices and you get a fusion category. Also, the fusion can be non commutative right? Exactly, right. Unlike in unitary modular. Exactly, right? exactly. Here, here. They don't require, it's associative, but it doesn't mm -hmm. have to be commutative. And there's no R. That's right. Yeah, there always is commutative. But there are also examples that is commutative fusion category, but you cannot uplift it to a braided fusion category. You could not make it in your DC. Any other question? So now let me give you a simple example with the icing. Is the simplest uh, CFT that you could consider is the Ising CFT. So it has three Verasoro primaries. And these are the, the formal dimensions. And there also exist three topological lines. 
So it has a Z2 symmetry, it's given by this eta line, so it generates a Z2 symmetry. And also has this duality line called the Kramer's Vernier duality line. So let me tell you how it acts. So the Z2 symmetry acts very trivially. You know how it acts because we know the Ising CFD has a Z2 symmetry. So this is has charge, it's, it's not charge, but this has charge minus one. So when this acts on sigma, you get a minus sign. So eta times epsilon is epsilon, as eta times sigma is minus sigma. Right? But the action of this is more tricky because, so if you have n, and if you have epsilon here, you could try to move this topological line pass through epsilon. It's topological, you're free to do, do it. There is no pass. And once you do it, you get you get minus epsilon. So it's, it's not something very bizarre, but when you try to act on sigma, and you have n and you try to pass it through, you get uh, you get some operator which is actually not a local operator. You get the disorder operator when you try to push it because there will be a tail. And so you could say that these non-invertible symmetries act local operator to non-local operator in this sense. And when you do that, the correlation function, they don't change. So actually, I would have an action So my non, the non-invertible defects give me an action on the ordinary Hilbert space plus the twisted Hilbert space. So this is a disorder operator. This, this dashed line is just n. It's just eta. It's just a z2 line. So this mu lives at the end of these topological lines. It means we buy a state operator correspondence. It means that mu lives in the twisted Hilbert space, which is twisted by z2. I call it by this h of eta. So this non-invertible defect give me a unitary actually operator from this extended Hilbert space to itself. How it acts? So it acts same one to one, okay, trivial, epsilon to minus epsilon, sigma to mu, mu to sigma, but just mu is not a local operator because it attached to this line. And it's actually unitary, it's like a Z2 symmetry. But actually if you look at this action on psi, it looks like a Z4 symmetry because you could get a phase. And is that always the case? That, yeah, uh, actually, this can be, you could say it more generally. You could say that given any topological line L, you have a map you have a unitary map from this Hilbert space to this Hilbert space. So you twist the Hilbert space by this line, L tensor L star. Okay, I forgot to tell you something very important, sorry. I forgot to tell you the fusion rule here. So this is the Z2 line, so you have this, but this eta, and if you have n times n, so the fusion rule is that if you tensor n with itself, you get one plus eta, but if you fuse eta with n, or n with eta, you get n. This is why it's non-invertible, because the fusion rule is non-invertible, but this is a z2. So actually, what I, this is a special case of this, because n tensor n bar, so these lines are also dual. That this star, it means just orientation reversal on the line. So n star is the same as n, and n tensor n is one plus eta, so that's why. This is a special case of this. And usually, if you have a non invertible line, you have a unitary map from this extended Hilbert space to itself. So you could still define it. And there is also a sense of uh, a, a way of also viewing L as a duality line. You could say that, in, okay, I'm not going to explain, I'm just going to say it in this word. It's complicated. There is a notion that you could gauge this line, and that this theory is dual under gauging this line. And so this line is also can be used as a duality line. I have to explain what do I mean by gauge. So should I think of this duality line as acting on a space that's bigger than the usual Hilbert space of the conformal field theory? 
Yeah, in, in some sense, yes, because you could say you act in a local operator, you create a non-local operator. Yeah, I mean, because obviously there isn't a consistent control filter that has all of these operators in it simultaneously or yes. mutually local. But H eta is part of the data of the Ising CFT. It's just what you get by quantizing the Ising CFT with eta running a long time. Yeah. So, okay. yeah. But, yeah. Thank you for the question. Any other question? It's like, in an, like if you did a Z2 orbital form, it's this operator was neither in the original CFT yeah. or the orbital form, yeah. but rather when you sort of combine the original one with the twisted sector of the orbital. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's equivalent to saying that the theory is, is self dual under gauging eta. But if we gauge eta, the z2, we get the same theory back. Yeah. This also can be slightly generalized. I said that you could gauge this and you get the same, same theory back. Any line can be viewed as a duality line, but for a very exotic way of gauging. But this last statement is less obvious how you will generate, how you would generalize it to higher dimensions. Is it so true that so this is, to prove this, this is not, it is easy actually. You have to draw some weird configuration on the cylinder. So you have to do something like but If you have like a, a, a 1D line in 3D. And so this map is realized by this. So you have the line L. Is it clear what I'm doing? So on the cylinder here, I, I pierce it with L times L bar. I have different orientation on that. So here I get a state in this Hilbert space, and above I get a state in this Hilbert space. And pictorial is obvious that you could create another map, which is the inverse of this map. Yeah. And I would assume that you could do the same trick in higher dimension, you just have to- But it's it. gonna depend. Okay, yeah. I, there, are, I, there are different choices. So, so for, for 2D, for 2D defects, I, I see how it would, how the same statement would carry through, but for 1D defects and 3D, then it, I guess. Uh, yeah. It's, so, yeah, to make sense of this, so I'm looking at the Hilbert space on the circle. Yeah. For higher dimension, you have different choices. You yeah. have to fix your incoming space and outgoing space, and then there could be different topologies in between. But you think there's some kind of statement? There could be, yeah, but there might be more freedom and then more interesting. You just don't have a single map, but different map depending on fixing the, the space. Thanks for the question. Any other question? So now let me go to the dynamical part two, dynamical application. So, So the idea here is just like a tooth anomaly matching. I'm not going to write it. So it's like a tooth anomaly matching that you have a QFT in the UV. You do you deform it with a, some symmetric deformation, and you want to understand what is the IR is the IR QFT. So there are usually two choices. So it's either gap. The theory is either gapless or gapped. So if it's gapless, you get a non-trivial CFT, but if it's gapped, you get a non-trivial TQFT. So in this talk, I'm gonna focus on the second part. So I want to see what happens if you have a, some non-invertible symmetry in the UV, you deform it with some complicated, you have a complicated RG flow, which respect the symmetry, but that your theory is gapped. So I want to understand all the possibility here. Because we know if the theory is gapped, it flows to a 2D TQFT. So I want to just, I can just classify all possible 2D TQFTs given a non invertible symmetry. If I have the full classification, then I can solve this problem. For example, there could exist some non invertible symmetry which just doesn't have a trivial TQFT which realizes it. It means that the theory in the infrared should have, a, should be non trivial and have vacuum degeneracy. So to Explain this idea, I'm going to demonstrate it in an example of uh, adjoint QC to make it more physical. So I'm going to discuss this example of 2D adjoint QCD to, to show you how this works, how it has a powerful application. It's not a virtual symmetry. 
you could prove some, some very non-trivial statement about 2D QCD, which I don't know how to prove it without using non-invertible symmetries. The, this 2D adjoint QCD, I should think of this as the, the left or already in the IR phase. It's already sort of topological, right? Or semi topological. Uh, so, not, not actually. So, in the UV, it's, you have a, it's not topological. It just turns out to be with this matter content of one adjoint myelin fermion, it's gapped. So, it flows to a DQFD. I'm oh, sorry, there's extra matter here. Yeah, so it's adjoint. So, let me describe the model. So, the model. Is so it's two dimensional one plus one space one space one time two dimensional uh, SUN gauge theory plus an adjoint my Roma fermion so I'll explain why it's gap and everything, but yeah, this is the model that we want to study, okay? So this model, so, so when the, so there's also a mass term, so let me write it. So I could also add a mass term for the fermion. So when the theory is massless, so when m is zero, this is my model, when we study this model. So this has been studied extensively uh, in the 90s by Gross, uh, Klebanov, uh, Smilka, Matitsen, and it, it was argued that the theory is deconfined. That uh, at zero mass, all the Wilson lines have parameter law and the theory is uh, Deconfined, so it's 95, but deconfined. But more recently, by a group by uh, okay, this group of people two years ago, they, they argued that the theory is actually confined. They argue at zero mass, all the all the Wilson line besides the fundamental Wilson line to the power of n over two, this line is deconfined, but all the other Wilson lines are confined. But here we are going to show that so the argument of so here the argument was just some uh, Well, just some uh, zero model of the, uh, the Dirac operator on some instanton background. So they computed, so they said that if you insert a very big rectangular Wilson lines, you want to compute expectation value of it. There is some zero mode for the Dirac operator expectation, the Dirac operators, and it makes this configuration to vanish. So that's why uh, all the lines have parameter law and this is zero. But this group showed that this uh, zero mode counting or this, this, their index theorem, sorry, their index theorem, their index theorem, their index theorem is wrong, and they said that there only exists a mod to index theorem. What, what is the answer from the region here? Yeah. There's, no, there's no Higgs in this point, right? Yeah, so basically the instanton is just so if you have a very large rectangle with someone and you go to the past infinity, this is like a creating an instanton. But you could just view it as just a very big rectangle or something. That's what they did. It just in that configuration, there is a zero mode. So it's like a theta term for the H field. But it's a discrete theta term in non abelian, so it's more complicated. But for abelian, it's just literally theta, theta term, a big. The so time is not topological. So it's a. Uh, 
So there, there, there exists some one form symmetry, which is like, like that. We have a, like a local topological operators I'm going to discuss. I'm pretty sure that's not how Gross described it. <laughs> yeah, they, so they, who's they, right? Huh? Who's right here? Okay, I'm going to explain this. <laughs> so I'm going to show that actually uh, this scenario is right, but this scenario can be also right if you add a quartic deformation. Oh, okay. So there is a quartic deformation which is protected by the non invertible symmetries. So if you know about non invertible symmetries, you say that if I just deform my UV with some deformation that only preserve, that preserve the symmetries, I'm not going to generate this quartic deformation, which is going to break the non invertible symmetries. And actually, if you don't add them, we get the full confinement. But when we add that quartic deformation, we almost all the time find this scenario. So this Lagrangian is like tuned from the point of view of symmetries, right? This from the invertible symmetries tuned, but for non invertible symmetries, actually natural because they break the symmetry. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. so it's like a, you have to also extend the notion of naturalness and also consider non invertible symmetries. Because you could prove that there is this selection rule on the amplitude that if you add them, all the one point function involving those operators vanishes. So the quartic terms will break non invertible symmetries? So there are two quartic terms. One of them yeah, breaks non invertible symmetries. One of them is harmless. You could add it. Yeah. Yeah, so if you deform with the, the harmless one that preserves all the symmetries, you are not going to generate the other one. Okay, so we are going to show that there exists like a two to the n non invertible symmetries. And they imply the deconfinement. And about that point, we're going to show that most of them, most of these symmetries, these are spontaneously broken and lead to the X on the end, show vacuum degeneracy. So first there exists this not exponential number of non symmetry with the confinement, and second of all, most of them are spontaneously broken, and they have vacuum degeneracy. So I'll try to explain this very quick. Okay, any questions? So, so let me first Discuss the confinement. The confinement. So the conf uh, confinement in 2D is very simple. It's because if you have a so first confinement is whether the Wilson lines have area law or perimeter law. But in two dimension, it's simple because if you if you have a Wilson line, it's gonna separate the space time into two disconnected parts. So you have the inside Wilson line and outside the Wilson line. So basically, if you are in vacuum. Let's, let me call it vacuum one. The inside will be in different vacuum. This means that if you have two local operators, you compute their correlation function. But if you compute the same correlation function inside of it, it's going to be different. So it means that you are in a different vacuum. I'm just imagining the Wilson line is very big. I, I don't care about it. I'm not worried about the boundary condition here. At the deep, the middle, you have this other vacuum and down there. Okay. So then, what is the expectation value if it's very large? So this is just basically. Uh, e to the minus area and e to minus e one. So this is the so e i is the vacuum uh, energy is the energy density of vacuum i. So e i is the energy density of vacuum i. So when it is large, this this, kind of, this amplitude is going to be equal to the area of this rectangular times E2 minus E1, where E2 is the energy of the vacuum 2, E1 is the energy of vacuum 1. So then you get a very simple criterion. You could say that E1 is equal to E2 if and only if you have deconfinement. So I only have to prove this fact for the deconfinement. Okay. So the way that I prove it is that I want to note that this theory has a Z and one form symmetry. So this, uh, the, the matter field is in the adjoint representation. So there exists a one form symmetry such that the Wilson lines are charged under the one form symmetry. So the one form symmetry, so if you have a Wilson line, mm -hmm. 
the, 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 the one from symmetry is generated by a topological point operator. And if I call it O, so this, this, this one from symmetry, it's a ZM one from symmetry, meaning O n to the one is one. And the way that it acts, it's if I have O W to the e to the two pi i over n W O. So it acts on the Wilson line, and based on the analogy of the representation of the Wilson line, I'm gonna get the nth root of unity. So it have a commutation relation. I get the phase. If I do this. So actually, the existence of these uh, one form symmetry or these topological lines, it means that mm. I have n different super selection sectors in my theory. So uh, so the, the property of because this O is a topological local operators, they are they commute with every other local operators. And you could take your Hilbert space and take the eigenspaces of O. So you could take a you could say you have you have different super selection sectors, different So you could act with O on the vacuum, and this O, because O to the power of n is 1, it has n different uh, eigenvalues. And each eigenvalues leads to a different separate su super selection sectors. And these are super selection sectors because they cannot mix with the action of local operators. And this is just because O commutes with any other local operator. So no local operator can change the eigenvalue of O. So the existence of a ZN one form symmetry, it means that there exist different super selection sectors that they cannot even mix on, on compact spaces. And we call these super selection sectors universes, because they, they, cannot, they cannot even mix on compact spaces. And this, this, this criteria means that universe one have, have the same energy as universe two, that all these N different super selection sectors have the same energy. So basically here, this vacuum two is in the, in, in, is in the different super, super selection sectors. And how I'm going to show that these different and different super selection sectors have the same energy? Okay, now I'm going to show. Sorry, sorry. The, the statement is that there exists such an O. So O exists because there's a Z and one form symmetry. Okay. Because you have a gauge theory with no fundamental matter, so that's always there in any dimension. And the one form symmetry is generated by a topological point operator O and because always, if you have a d minus one from symmetry, always there exists super selection sectors. Okay, so so the trick is that there exists. Uh, the key fact is that there exists a topological line L such that it has a charge under the one form symmetry. So there exists a topological line L such that there is this commutation relation. So this is a local operator, this is a line operator. So what that means, it means that if I act with L on vacuum one, I'm gonna create something in the second super selection sector, vacuum two. But because this, this line is topological, I'm not gonna change the energy here. Because this is just a symmetry, it's commute with the stress, ten stress transfer energy. So just the existence of these lines, it means that E1 equals E2. Because there exists a line charge under one. That's giving me a reconfinement. But I haven't shown you why this line exists, but so these lines aren't the Wilson lines, even though they yeah, also these have... are topological. Yeah. Great, but they also have like the Wilson lines, they'll take you from a vacuum to another. Yeah, they have the same charge under the one form symmetry. 
the difference. So basically, you could say the Wilson line is screened because you could break the Wilson line and put the topological line in between. So it, they cannot have an area law because you could just break them and it cannot depend on area and the line in between topological. This is a mechanism for screening topological lines. Okay, in the remaining 10 minutes, is there any question about this? Okay, so let me very quickly explain the vacuum degeneracy. How do you know that slime brings you from one vacuum to another? Okay, great. So because so if I act with O on both sides, so if I act with O here and here, right? Let me do that. I do the commutation relation, I get O and I get a face. Right? So it means that it means that this L changes the eigenvalues under O, so it's a different supersection surface. Any other questions? Okay, so uh, yeah, so let me very briefly mention this. So, so you could also to discuss the vacuum degeneracy, you want to understand what is the IRT QFD that actually falls to. So we want to understand the theory. So one way to understand it is by via uh, non-abelian bosonization. So the uh, so the adjoin the my the adjoin QCD. The SUN, so we have SUN, and so if if you have uh, it has n squared my run of fermion, so you take n squared minus one my run of fermion and you do bosonization and you get spin n squared minus one double z double model, right? So this is like a fermion in the agile representation of SUN. So you just stop with free fermion, but then you gauge SUN. So you mod it by SUN. And here, this becomes equivalent to this closer model. To spin n squared minus 1, mod SUN level NWZW gauge model. But the difference is that you also have a kinetic term. You also add a kinetic term. Y level n? Yeah, so you have to work out. So there is a embedding, there is a conformal embedding of SUN to spin. And some degree n. And so, so, yeah. and then. so it becomes dual to this model. If there were no uh, kinetic term, you could say, okay, I know this is a coset CFD. I know its central charge. The central charge is the central charge of the numerator minus the central charge of the denominator, but it turns out to be zero. So it's a circle zero. It actually flows between TQFD because central charge is zero. And we understand this TQFD, it's an exponential number of vacuum. But you want to also understand it when you add this kinetic term, which is a strongly coupled problem. We don't know how to solve it. But, but the point is that these kinetic terms preserve the non-invertible symmetries. And even with the non-invertible symmetries, we could list all the possible IRT QFDs that is possible. And that is done by classifying, by first understanding the topological lines or non-invertible symmetry of these cosets, which preserve, are preserved by the kinetic term, and classifying all possible 2D TQFTs which have that symmetry. And when we do classification, we find that the smallest one is actually this coset, which has exponential number of aqua. So we find that uh, this RG flow will land on some theory which has exponential number of aqua. But I would, wouldn't have time to explain. So exponential means exponential in system size. In N. In N, in N. okay. Yeah. Good, so it's uh, just a... Uh... So for example, this has, I, I think, two, uh, three times two to the power of N minus one vacuum. You could just count the exact number of vacuum for this guy. I guess three times two to the N minus one. And there is no smaller representation, it seems. So yeah, I wouldn't have time to discuss how it works in detail, but that's it. thank you for this. Could you elaborate on the the quartic uh, story, which I think is yes. Okay. So 
So there are, there are two, three terms that you could add. So you have a double trace, you have a single trace, and you have two double traces. And all of these terms are neutral from the point of view of standard symmetries. No. So one of these terms creates charge conjugation. Charge conjugation. So we just throw, throw it away. Yeah. The other two, one of them preserve all the symmetries, and one of them only breaks the non invertible, uh, only breaks the. Yeah, one of them only breaks the non invertible ones. Yeah, and the one that breaks the non invertible one is the difference between the two problems here that got different answers. Exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you preserve it with the quartic, we, we, we just ignore the one that breaks the charge conjugation, we deform the one that's preserve all the symmetries because we cannot tune that. Yeah, but the second guy that breaks them could add it or not add it. If we not add it, we get the first scenario. If we add it, we almost always get the second one, but not always. There are some weird cases that you get some, uh, some people some with negative tension. And, and what goes into the calculation for seeing that it's not invariant under the, the non-invertible symmetry? The, the... Oh, we, we can just find the IRT QFT. We, we, so we have yeah. a. So, sorry, I mean, like you have these three terms. One, one of them you said breaks, uh, preserves charge conjugation, but breaks the non invertible symmetry. No, no. One of them breaks charge conjugation. Right, right. right. So right. one of them preserves charge conjugation and breaks the non invertible symmetry. That's right. I think, I think yeah. the question is so how do you, how do you actually it? identify it and tell that it breaks the non invertible symmetry if you're just a UV person? Oh, okay. Using, you know, you showed us all these pictures of how things right, right, right. like, so, are. Yeah, yeah. So you could actually, um, so this operator transform under some representations of your SUN or spin N. So there are, so this, the, the, the operators of the coset are labeled by two representation. So one representation of here and there. So these are like, you have the adjoint here and some representation of SUN. If you, have, if you identify the corresponding representation, then these topological lines are coming from the Berlin delight. They act by S matrix. So you have S matrix and you, you, know, you know how they act, and some of them just act trivially, meaning that they commute by knowing the representation here. Because okay, so you would go to the Bosonized language, that's the yes, easiest yes, yes. way to. Right, you, yeah, you could use the Bosonization. Exactly. So when you, when, you turn on the, when you turn that operator on, can you see from the index theorem what goes wrong and what changes? Was the index theorem calculation that these people originally did correct at all? Or? Yeah. So they say that there are only the, the index theorem. I guess later on, Smith also wrote a paper that admits that the, the, the index theorem was wrong. There only exists a mod two index theorem, and that's why because one of these terms I told you that it preserves still the the invertible symmetry. So this theory has a Z two chiral symmetry in the fermionic theory, and that Z two chiral symmetry also is charged under the, okay. So then there is a chiral symmetry, so let me call it chi. So Z2 chi topological line is charged uh, under the, the Z2 subgroup of Zn1 from symmetry, if n is, if n is even. Because this is true only for when n is even. So when n, when n is even, there is a Z21 form symmetry, and this, this topological lines is charged under the one form symmetry. So it makes only this kind of Wilson lines deconfined. And you get a mod 2 index only in the presence of such topological lines, so such Wilson lines. So you, you have an exact mod 2 index theorem because there, there is a, like an invertible symmetry. But for the general one, you don't have anything. Because this index theorem only comes from the invertible symmetries. So if there's a small fermion mass, this all this breaks down because then yeah. you don't have a power symmetry anymore. Exactly. So if you add a mass term, 
it kind of breaks all the symmetries, invertible or non-invertible, and actually the theory becomes confined. Everyone agrees with that. And actually what we also did, we compute the string tension at the leading order in M over G. So at leading order in M over G, using non-invertible symmetry, we also computed the string tension. We find a formula such as this. So if you have a Wilson line, so this is the tension, we call it tau, of a Wilson line with analogy k. If you have a Wilson line which has k young tableau boxes in this representation, it's going to have some tension. And its tension is going to look like something like this. There is some factor, of course, here, but this is how it changes with k. This is the leading, and there is also is some S matrix ratio, this t. So, okay, the way that we find is, is very. Uh, is that it's very bizarre the way we found this formula. So uh, finding this TQFD is very non-trivial. So what we did, we solved it explicitly for n equals two, three, four, and five. And we computed these tensions. And then we find some square root of two, some square root of three. But this formula was discussed in some supersymmetric context. And well, what is the string tension in the TQFD? I'm confused when you said that you computed it in the It's TQFD. just when it has an area log, when it's confined, this is just a. So if you have a roof on line. But so how is that part of the data of the TQFT if it's confined? Are you saying you can compute T from the TQFT or you can okay, compute yeah. it from something the else? The way that it works is basically so when you add the mass term, I, I told you that it's the confined if all Oh, it's like an energy splitting between exactly. the universes. Yeah, okay, I see. Yeah, uh -huh, uh -huh. You compute yeah. the expectation value of the mass operator in different super yeah, 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 yeah. That okay. give you yeah. the tension leading yeah. piece. Yeah, I see. Yeah. And then we found, we figured out that this, our formula matches with this. Mm -hmm. So we only verified after it was five, but it seems that it's true. We don't have a proof for it. Any more questions? If not, let's thank Sahand again. Actually, if you, if you do super symmetry,